We are back for episode two of our first gen Tacoma build. Like we went over in the first video, this is gonna be our kit R&D truck. So we're gonna be developing the trailing arm kit for the back, the three link kit for the front, skid plates, couple of little items. In front of me are some of the parts that I know we're gonna be using. We've got a set of our trailing arms, some frame side axle hanger brackets, link mounts, some 14 inch Fox coilovers, and some 2.0 bump stops. First order of business is to get these frame plates on and make sure they fit verify that the new bed mounts are in the same spot as they were before then we can start hanging an axle under this thing you can see that we already ground the frame down for where are these frame plates are going to fit just took off all the paint so we have a nice weld surface i had to modify this a little bit and cut the corner out just because where the cab is i couldn't get the welder in there and i don't want to give you guys something you can't weld but if everything went right you should pretty much click into place he's ready to get clamped and welded I was able to get fitment right on the bed mount brackets. They're about a 16th high on both sides. So thankfully I took notes on where the old ones were, got these to match everything like that. But now we're gonna test fit the bed and then we can get an axle under this thing and start hanging some links. Okay, ready? One, two, three. What do you guys say? I think um, bed lines up where it was supposed to. Jet putting the GoPro on his forehead was a A-class move. Now we are good to bolt the bed in and figure out where a tire's gonna go under there. NFO. NFO. One of the things that's a bit disappointing about the first gens compared to the second and third gens is right in here, if you look, you see like the fender well itself and actually the bed mount are pretty restrictive as far as stretching the wheelbase goes. I typically like to push the wheelbase back a couple inches because it saves you having to cut into the front of the bedside. It makes the truck look a little more proportionate in my opinion once you start to trim the fenders. But in this case, we're kind of bound to what the truck gives us. Like we could obviously go overboard and offer like an inner fender well, but then we'd have to mess with the bed mounts and things like that. And I just don't want to overcomplicate this process as much as, yeah, it would be cool to get the wheelbase stretch. I think we're just gonna stick with what we have. So we've got the axle in place, the bed's back on, everything is lined up. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take the lower link brackets on the axle and mount them to the axle. Lucky for me, when we did Corey's first gen, if you've seen that video, I took a couple notes on the mounting width for the trailing arm brackets on the axle. So I got a little cheat sheet there. What I'm gonna be doing is mounting those to the axle. I have a set of 35s that I use as rollers that I will be putting on this to center the axle within the factory wheel opening so that we just trim everything evenly when we go to a bigger tire. And once that's all in place, that'll kind of let me bolt my trailing arms up and mount the trailing arm brackets on the chassis based on just where they land. I'll even them out side by side. Then we'll set full bump, get the bed back off and start mounting some shocks. So as you can see, we got the 35 on there. I've got it fairly centered front to back. I may move the axle back a quarter inch from center, but that's about it. From here, I know we're centered enough to get things going, so I'm gonna pull that 35 off, level the truck out, level the axle out. You can see I moved the lift arms further forward so I can get the brackets in for the trailing arms. Gonna stick these things together, get them measured out, and we can hang them under the truck and see how we're looking. These are the trailing arm brackets that go on the frame side of our second gen Tacoma kits. The Tacoma frames on the second and third gens are a lot taller. So you can see here, we ended up trimming about an inch and a half off the top of the bracket. This is where we put them when we did Corey's truck. I might just switch to this dimension for all of the kits so we can have one bracket to keep our production line simple. But for now, we got these cut down. We're gonna test fit the link on the frame, clean up the frame where these land and start mounting some suspension parts.
now that we got our trailing arms in, we're able to pull the bed back off because our wheelbase is set and that's really all we put the bed on for. We went ahead and figured out where our full bump is gonna be. There's about four inches between the axle and the frame. The reason I'm not going any higher is because once you put a 40 inch tire on this thing and start cycling it, you're getting pretty high up in the bed. And on top of that, like we discussed earlier, the rear fender well that's in the bed right there is fairly restrictive and we're trying to avoid having to cut that out because that's just a slippery slope. You cut the bed out, next thing you know, you're cutting into your frame to get extra up travel and it's, you might as well back half your truck at that point. So, got my upper link bracket here. We know where this goes on the axle. It just slides all the way into the cast on the center section of this Sterling axle. And this is our upper link bracket from our second gen front kit that's gonna work perfectly in the back of this thing. So I got my link made, but we're running into one little issue. Once we put our upper link bracket on the axle of this thing, it's very clear to see that our upper link's gonna be hitting this cross member here. I don't wanna leave any up travel on the table just for something like that. We're gonna be cutting through the bed to get the shock towers in this truck. We just can't get the up travel we're looking for without having to cut into there. So I figured I'm not gonna let that stop me and I'm not gonna let this cross member stop me. So I'm guessing we're gonna probably put like an eight to 10 degree bend in that upper link. So I'm gonna tack this bracket on the axle, fit the upper link, take a couple measurements and make sure we bend this thing as little as possible. So right about here is where I want it to bend. Just put a quick mark there. I'm probably gonna bend this to about 12 degrees on the bender. Figured it'll spring back to about 10. We'll test fit it. There's no point in bending it more than it needs. So let's see what we got. I got this sweet new fan from Home Depot on sale. So yeah, I had to buy it. But uh, I don't think the bracket will transfer enough heat to the Heim to cook the Teflon in there, but we got some cheap insurance. Now that all three links are in place, it's time for us to put the pan hard bar in this thing. What I've got so far is Basically what we run on the second gen kits, but this is an inch and a quarter shorter. This is the axle side pan hard bracket. The reason I'm running a shorter axle side pan hard bracket on this is because we're going to be running a little more up travel than the second gen kits due to the fact that we have to cut through the bed anyways for the shocks. Might as well squeeze a couple more inches out of that thing. And I don't want to have to notch the frame, so that requires me to lower the axle side pan hard bracket. We're going to get this tacked on. You can see here, I've actually got a pan hard bar off of our second gen kits as well. Dimensionally, it should work. This is an inch and a half quarter wall piece. We're gonna go ahead and stick the axle side bracket on. We're gonna kind of put this in place and I'll show you guys how I do the math for my frame side bracket once I've gotten there. So when I do these, my goal is to have a flat pan hard bar at ride height. In the front, it's practically impossible because your pan hard bar location is dictated off of your pitman arm location. That's something we'll get into when we get to the front. In the back, you kind of have free game, just kind of put in whatever fits and whatever makes the most sense. And to me, I like a pan hard bar flat at ride height. Right here, what we did is we went ahead and took a measurement. Everything's level here. The truck's level front to back and side to side. So I took a measurement from the ground to the center point of the pan hard bar bracket on the axle. It's 29 and a half inches. Then I took a measurement on the driver's side where the pan hard bracket's gonna go, and I measured from the ground to the frame side, 29 and a half inches. So I know that I'm intending to have eight inches of up travel, which means that the axle is gonna move down eight inches from its location now, meaning that I want my pan hard bar bracket to be eight inches from the bottom of the frame. Well, the bracket off our second gen kit is eight inches from the bottom of the frame to the pivot point. I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to use this. This has been sitting under my plasma table in the, maybe it's scrap, maybe I'll use it one day pile. So I put a little notch on this side of it to fit around this frame plate. Let's give that a look. I'm gonna notch a little bit out of the other side of it.
We got the pan hard bar in, brackets are in, and now we've went ahead and cut this little cross tube. I run these from one side of the frame down to the other side on the bracket for the pan hard bar because the frame side pan hard bar bracket sees a lot of load. There's a lot of leverage with how far the bracket hangs down. So a brace right there is a must on these setups. Last thing we need to put on here before we can figure out where the shocks are going to go is this little tab. And this is a replacement fuel filler neck mounting tab. So we're going to put this in place. This keys into the frame as well so it's easy to line up. We're going to bolt that fuel filler neck where it goes so that we can get the shock as far forward as possible without interfering with that fuel filler neck. going on here is the shocks all the way in what I've made here is the top of the shock tower I built this first because what I like to do and things like this that makes it really easy is I'll lock my shock up in place where I want it uh, slash where it fits from here we're limited how far the shock can lean forward by the fuel filler neck that's why I put it in now I got the top plate on now I can build the vertical support to it here the back piece and the rear piece and then from there it's done and we'll have all the files flip them to the passenger side tack that together make sure everything fits nice and happy and we're moving forward so i got this all mocked up you can see i got my little fixture to keep this thing from moving forward to backwards i got my level on there that's zero this will be the first piece that goes in so when we set this up we obviously want this to be at zero and we're going to make sure that it comes off the frame square too everything seems to fit really well we're going to take our square Make sure it's square out the frame. I'm gonna call that good. It's not perfect, but 0.1 degree, that'd be our little secret. Throw another tack on the back here. Got our back plate here. You can see I put a bend in it. The reason I did is because if I let it run all the way down straight, it was gonna cross right over the top of the axle tube therefore getting in the way of where a bump stop would go. So this is gonna be 72 degrees angled down. This has been at 18 degrees to where this is vertical at 90 degrees still. It'll still fit a piggyback reservoir. That's the goal with these bigger shock towers is I wanna give you guys the option to run what you want. Personally, I like a piggyback. I think they look cooler. Uh, makes it a little bit easier package wise. You don't have to hang reservoirs. This setup here, uh, I didn't have piggyback shocks. So this is what we got. And the moment of truth is we'll see if it's square off the frame. Damn! I'll take that! Off a tenth of a degree, but uh, I'm not complaining. This should be able to come off now. Boom. Just like that, we got a shock mount. Last piece of the puzzle is the back cap for the shock tower. I always start out with a piece of cardboard, so make this, make sure it all fits really good. From there, I just put all my measurements on it. Uh, and my angles get everything dialed. I usually have some like 16 to 18 gauge that I just use for cutting templates. So you can see it's all rusty from sitting outside. Pull the sheet in, I'll cut a template. Once I know that everything's good, that what comes off the table is exactly what I need for the piece, I'll go ahead and finalize everything, clean everything up, and cut it out of 316. So from here, I'll tack this piece in, and that's our shock tower put together.
We got the shock towers all tacked up on this thing and I think mechanically everything is there that we need to droop this thing out and take a look. I want to get it up in the air, measure how much wheel travel it has overall and I would like to cycle it, make sure the shocks don't hit, everything like that. So why don't we get this thing up in the air. So just like our second gen stuff, real tight clearance there at full droop, but it's not going to go anymore. So if it clears here and all that's good, it's going to clear everywhere else. Then obviously at full droop, we have all the shock clearance that we need. With the spring on there, we're going to get another about inch of clearance loss from here to here. So we take that into account when we do it, of course. Now we're going to cycle it and make sure it all clears there. Everything's looking pretty good. It's close to the cab, but as you can see, that's all the way bottomed out. It's not going to go up anymore. That clears there. On this side, it is a little bit tighter. You can see that right here, I have about 5 eighths of an inch. That's really close. My one saving grace. The one thing I have on my side is this. When I build these, I build it centered at full bump left to right that way i can get my shocks up and down straight i know everything is symmetrical right but when this thing's at ride height with the swing of the pan hard bar the axle is actually moved to the passenger side an extra about five eighths of an inch i have enough thread exposed here that once it's at ride height i'll rein that bar back in and get it even side to side what that means here and the point i'm making is right here we got about an inch and a half and on the driver's side, when everything's fully bumped out, we only had about five eighths of an inch. Five eighths of an inch isn't enough, but an inch and a half is more than enough clearance. Once I get this thing to ride height and center the axle side to side, I anticipate I'll have about an inch of clearance in between the coilover and the frame on both sides, which is right in that sweet spot where we want to be. It'll be tight when it fully cycles, but we won't have any clearance issues at all. So we cycled this thing, everything seems to clear and it's nice and happy. There's a couple more things I wanna to do to the back, but as far as just kit development goes, we are at 100% here. So this is ready for Josh to scan. Now we need to get on the front. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you can see episode three, where we get the front end under this thing. We'll see you then. See ya, Damn.